On today's Daily Detroit, a plot to kidnap the governor has been stopped with charges against six men, as well as seven others for a plot to attack the state capitol. Plus, conservative hoaxers get arraigned for voter intimidation of those in the 313 area code. And then finally, a deep dive conversation with Steve Fries of Newsweek and Our Detroit. He's back to talk about the prospects of races for two local U.S. House seats and a Michigan senator. It's Thursday, October 8th, 2020. I'm Jer Stays. It's a heck of a day. Let's get started. All of us standing here today want the public to know that federal and state law enforcement are committed to working together to make sure violent extremists never succeed with their plans, particularly when they target our duly elected leaders. The federal complaint in this case alleges that the FBI began an investigation earlier this year after becoming aware that through social media that a group of individuals was discussing the violent overthrow of certain government and law enforcement components. That's the voice of U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Michigan, Andrew Burge. And if you had on your 2020 bingo card alleged plot to violently overthrow the government and kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, well, I'm speechless. That's because Thursday, charges were announced against six men in federal court for just that. Additionally, seven others were charged on the state level for targeting police and the state capitol. The 13 suspects were rolled up in an operation that included 200 law enforcement officers across a dozen cities. So let's sort through this disturbing mess. First, the federal charges around the potential kidnapping. According to an FBI affidavit, six men trained and plotted for months with members of a group that the feds described as a militia and did rehearsals in August and September as well as surveilled the governor's vacation residence. The conspirators were foiled when four of them planned to meet Wednesday to make a payment on explosives and exchange tactical gear. Their plan was to distract police with an explosion and then make their move. The suspects had gone as far as successfully detonating an improvised explosive device wrapped with shrapnel. I'd note that's similar to tactics used by other terrorist groups around the world. The plan was to get 200 men together and storm the Capitol. They would also kidnap Governor Whitmer from her vacation home, overthrow the government, and take her to Wisconsin to stand on some sort of trial for treason before the November 3rd election. The charges could put the accused men in prison for life. And the state charges involve a group called the Wolverine Watchmen. They include, among other things, identifying the home addresses of police officers, threats of violence to instigate civil war leading to societal collapse, and more. Now, there will be more details that come out about all of this, and we will circle back to this as this just broke hours ago, but I'm going to add this thought. Remember back when the state capitol had all those heavily armed protesters who went into the building and into the legislature's chambers with their weapons? That's still completely okay to do, according to the capitol rules. They weren't checked if the weapons were loaded either. The number of people and weapons were significant enough that if someone wanted to get shooting, it would have been a deadly incident in Lansing. And frankly, the Michigan State or Capitol Police wouldn't have been able to do much about it. So imagine if that group in the spring had been this group. A harrowing thought. A pair of well-known conservative hoaxers and provocateurs allegedly are behind 12,000 robocalls in the 313 area code, discouraging people from voting. In an update to a story we brought you a few weeks ago, Jacob Wool and Jack Berkman face four felony counts in Detroit's 36th District Court. They include one count of election law intimidating voters, one count of conspiracy to commit an election law violation, one count of using a computer to commit the crime of election law, and that includes intimidating voters, and using a computer to commit the crime of conspiracy. The pair were arraigned Thursday. The calls were targeted at the majority black city of Detroit and other urban areas around the country. They falsely claimed that voting by mail in the upcoming election on November 3rd would mean people could be arrested, debts collected, and that voters could be subject to forced vaccination. The charges have the potential of up to 12 years in prison due to Michigan's consecutive sentencing laws, and thousands of dollars in fines if convicted. For their part, Wall told media in August that it was, quote, leftist pranksters, unquote. Back by popular demand and with a new election topic to talk about that I think is 
Very important because, you know, here at Daily Detroit, we really like to focus on things locally. And I know that uh, today we're recording this on a Thursday. A lot of the conversation is about the debate last night, the vice presidential debate, uh, what's going to happen in the future. But I want to I want to focus the lens locally because I think it's really important. And in reality, so much politics starts locally. So Newsweek contributor and news and features editor at Our Detroit, Steve Fries, is back with us. Steve, it's good to hear from you. It's great to be back on. Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to do this kind of orderly. Uh, first off, I want to start breaking down these House districts, these House representative races. Let's start out with Alyssa Slotkin, who's in a very competitive race in Michigan's 8th district. She's a former CIA analyst. And her district, so listeners know, ranges from Lansing to the outburbs of Metro Detroit. It's it's kind of large, Steve. It is. And the more important part is in between that is this vast stretch of rural, small town, much more conservative Michigan. So in a lot of ways, it is very much a microcosm of the state itself. I mean, let's put it this way. If she if she wins her race, which is likely, but if she wins her race, then it would be virtually impossible for Joe Biden to lose the state. Mm. Like, I mean, those two things just couldn't coexist. And so there's a lot to be said about this particular district, how diverse it is, and what kind of a candidate she is. Well, and the kind of candidate that she is to that point, you know, although there's been a lot of people trying to paint each side into different corners, Slotkin is definitely a moderate. Slotkin definitely performs as a political moderate. God only knows what she really believes in her personal heart of hearts, but she does take this interesting middle ground where she plays up her national security credentials, having worked in the CIA, her bipartisan credentials by having worked in the CIA for both Bush and Obama. You could have seen, theoretically, her running as a relatively liberal Republican. And maybe that would have been a more durable political strategy for her. But she's a Democrat, and she has done quite a good job over the course of her two years in office of keeping herself front and center for specifically bipartisan efforts. You know, she was not down for Nancy Pelosi when she was elected. She, I believe, voted present uh, when the speakership came up in January of 2019. And she's tried real hard to sort of thread the needle where she's for the trade deal that the president has put forward. But she also feels like the president's conduct with respect to Ukraine and many other things justified impeachment. So, you know, she's trying real hard to sort of follow her gut wherever it takes her. And she's really explicit about it. Like, I, I don't know another congressperson who is that open to publicly brooding over what to do. <laughs> mm. I mean, it's not like she's indecisive exactly, but she seems to think that talking very openly about the electoral challenges, uh, decisions she's making that might cost her votes, you know, the torment of having to impeach a president, even though she, during the, her election, she said she didn't really want to. I don't know. She's very open and blunt about it. And I guess that adds to the uh, authenticity. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people talk about how there isn't that many people who are undecided. But is she kind of reflecting her district, which, you know, has different political stories within it? Yeah. I mean, she when you think back on it, she could never have been elected if there was not a 2018 Democratic wave. And she was a very much standard bearer of much of how the Democrats took back the House. She pushed very hard on pre-existing conditions and, and health care, which is now a very popular issue. And somehow the Republicans don't realize that. They haven't figured out that Obamacare is actually very popular. So they continue to try to undo it for some reason. But she ran in a, on a, in a very centrist way in a very mixed district. And she unseated a Republican congressman who was actually pretty popular. 
Mm. You know, now she's running for re-election and she's up against a thoroughly traditional Republican who's also proving not to be a very good politician, not a very good candidate. She's got very favorable conditions. She had them two years ago and she has has them now. Well, we both noticed a debate that happened on WDIV with Devin Skillian with her and her challenger. And it was interesting to me, especially in an exchange about healthcare, which is what we were talking about, that she kind of showed him to be not really prepared to discuss things like on an actual basis. Like I, one of the, the things that is just standing out to me with this entire political cycle is how much people aren't answering the questions in front of them and how much like there seems to be this pointing towards these platitudes. But then when you get to the actual details, things seem to fall apart. And that did for her challenger during this debate where she tried to talk about uh, Slotkin's mother situation and didn't seem to really have the details about it. Yeah, Alyssa Slotkin's mother died of cancer. And Alyssa Slotkin's mother avoided treatment for a very long time because she couldn't afford it and she didn't want to burden her kids with the cost of it. And it had nothing to do with regulation or the types of things that Republicans have been saying about the problems with health care in our country. And so it was political malpractice for him. He opened the door. This moment in debating is probably the kind of thing you will will see played in classes because he set it up. He set it up that, you know, if things had been different and there wasn't all this regulation, whatever that means, Slotkin's mother might not have had her problem. And all it did was turn his opponent's mother into a political football, which is not a good look. And it set her up to respond in very personal terms. And I think one of the problems with the healthcare debate that is rather different than many other things is it is very personal. Everybody worries about their health care, about the bills of their health care. Everybody's got friends or people who have pre-existing conditions or kids on their insurance or things like that. It's fine to say Obamacare didn't work, but the Republicans just have never been able or willing to provide a specific plan. And they've had so many opportunities. So it doesn't wash anymore. Well, and I'll end this Slotkin conversation specifically on a piece that you talked about that is kind of a wild card for her and her district, considering that it includes students that mm. involve Michigan State University. And it's something that adds a layer of extra tension with this race, doesn't it? Well, it's great for journalists. I don't know if it's great for her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, what's interesting is she actually brought this up to me and I ended up turning it into a national story because there are a number of other house races in a similar situation. Alyssa Slotkin's district includes MSU. And MSU is, as many college campuses, a huge honeypot for democratic activism and votes. In a normal year, those students on those campuses are doing the registration drives. They're going door to door for the candidates. They are certainly getting out the vote locally in the city where their school is for the candidate, Democrat usually, that they are supporting. And this year, because of the pandemic, MSU is a ghost town. The students are not there and they're scattered all over the state. And that won't necessarily matter for, say, Gary Peters or Joe Biden, because if they're still in Michigan, they're still going to vote Democratic. But for Alyssa Slocken, she says that she won by 13,000 votes in 2018, and about 7,000 of those were students voting in East Lansing. So she's nervous about this sort of mass shift of where people are. And in Alyssa Slotkin's case, they've sort of been anticipating this, though they've been trying to work harder on getting out minority voters in the East Lansing area and other parts of of the district where there are a number of them, uh, hoping that that can replace some of the votes that they're not going to see I do think that she probably, if I have to make a prediction, she probably will have a relatively easy victory 
her opponent has, has very little money. He's not very visible. She has been extremely visible and has, I think, made the case that she's sufficiently bipartisan. And this year in particular, I think that will work very well. I think she probably will have a hard, hard time in 2022 if Joe Biden is the president, if there's a Democratic president, and the Republicans come up with a serious seasoned challenger as opposed to the guy they got who has never run for anything before. So let's turn our focus to the 11th House District. And that's a big one. That's right now served by Haley Stevens, a Democrat. And it is one of those districts that was drawn in this way where it goes from Canton to Livonia to like this weird notch of Farmington and then Milford, then all the way over to Waterford and Troy, like kind of this crazy kind of sea in the metro Detroit suburbs. What's her situation? She's probably in a pretty good position. She's got a number of the suburbs that have turned sharply towards the Democrats, or at least for now, away from Trump. You know, Trump has really alienated particularly college-educated voters and specifically college-educated white women voters. Uh, And that's a big problem for him and a pretty good situation for Representative Stevens, who essentially is one of them. She is an, an educated suburban white woman who, like many other people, find a lot of the things that the president has said and done to be really repulsive. That's probably enough because her district was already less Republican than Alyssa Slacken's district, much less in terms of you know rural areas and all of that. So I don't think that there's going to be that much trouble. I I think that she's probably well on her way. And I think she's kind of played it safe, too, which reflects that she must know that the polling is showing that she's she's fine. Again, another case, another example where she's running against a essentially a sacrificial lamb candidate. I mean, Eric Estraki is an interesting person, but... Nobody knows who he is. He doesn't have enough money. He has no very little money, so far as I can tell. There's no support coming that I can tell from the National Republican Party because they just don't think that these are candidates that are worth putting money behind. So, you know, I think that both of these women are probably well on their way to their second terms and will probably face some pretty serious headwinds in 2022. That, that's when those races will be pretty interesting. If they break through and they're, they clear off in 2022, they're probably set for as long as they want to stay in those seats. Right. Because what tends to happen is kind of like a, a whiplash or a kind of like the, the pendulum swings back right. usually after elections. And that just seems to be the pattern most times when it comes to the electorate. Sure. And and also in this particular case where it looks like the Democrats, they could very well take the Senate. Mm. So if they have the entire federal government, then any and everything that happens is their responsibility. And you'll remember that in 2010, that was the year of the Tea Party. That was a massive loss for Democrats. 2014, the other midterm election that President Obama faced was a massacre. And then, you know, obviously 2018 was not pretty for for President Trump either. Mm, Yeah. You talked about the Senate. Let's go there. Specifically, Gary Peters, which has been an interesting race to me because uh, although some new polling that came out this week puts him ahead by 5.4 percent, he still hasn't broken that 50 percent margin. He's up uh, 46, 39 versus 39.6, according to the latest Glenn Gariff poll. But. James is raising money and, you know, I I get the campaign emails from both. You see Peter surrogates really pushing to keep raising money, that kind of thing. So it makes me feel like this is a lot closer than the other two races that we talked about, at least right now. And especially with the stance, especially with that fundraising stance, it really has me asking a lot of questions around it. What's your read? I'm fairly sure he'll pull it out again. It's one of these things where I just don't see how Joe Biden doesn't just carry the ticket over the line. And in this case, Michigan hasn't elected a Republican to the Senate since I think the 80s. It's been a long time. So it's sort of a a natural. And I I don't know that John James, for all of the charisma 
that people talk about and how he came so much closer than anybody expected in running against uh, Debbie Stabenow in, two years ago. I don't know that he is that great a candidate either. You know, he's been avoiding a lot of very tough questions. And it's the same conversation about health care. I just don't know how he breaks through. I mean, he might have a better chance if he turns on Trump, if, if he blatantly says that the president is not fit for office. I was a, a military person. I just can't put up with this anymore. But he's not going to do that. Maybe he can appeal to some voters who are Republican minded, but disgusted by Trump. Uh, who don't want to give Democrats the entire government. That might, you know, pull in a point or two more for him. And then there's the fact that Gary Peters is really unknown. He is the strangest political figure I've seen in many years. I mean, he's incredibly successful. Obviously, he's a U.S. senator. Mm -hmm. But he's still virtually unknown. I mean, I think he's probably the least well-known U.S. Senator in the country, certainly the least well-known U.S. Senator in the country by his own constituents. I don't see him losing because the Democratic ticket is so strong in general, but I also don't see a lot of enthusiasm for him. A couple of years ago, I remember talking to him up at the Mackinac Policy Conference, and it struck me how bookish he is. Mm -hmm. Like, it really struck me, like, he enjoyed those deeper topic issues, which I, of course, whether I agree with someone or not, I always enjoy getting into more of the wonky stuff. Right. But there isn't as much of the out there, the speeches. It just doesn't seem like that's who he is to be that outgoing, charismatic guy. It seems like he's Michigan's introvert senator, which, you know, for better or worse, seems to be the case. Well, it's funny because I spent many years of my career in Nevada and nobody could ever figure out how Harry Reid became as powerful as he is. I mean, he was. He, he had a crappy personality. He was crabby and, and <laughs> not a very interesting person. But somehow he had turned into a political genius and a political mastermind. Um, I don't know that Gary Peters is a political genius. I think Gary Peters, in a lot of ways, is a very lucky politician. And I think he'll probably make it through. I will say that you know, one of the things I find really interesting about John James is none of his ads say he's a Republican. Nope. And none of his ads offer really any policy proposals. It's all, even at this stage, the man has run for statewide office. Now, this is the second time in three years, and his ads are still essentially introducing himself. Well, one of our contributors who doesn't do the politics side, works more on the leisure side, got a door knocker. And it was funny because it was like, you know, it was businessman, helicopter, picture. Right. That was it. You know, as somebody who appreciates that a vigorous debate, it would be interesting to see more dimensions to this race. But I don't really feel like it's there. It's not going to happen. I mean, the Republicans are painted into this corner on health care. They're stuck. They have no plan. The plan that they would come up with would basically be Obamacare. <laughs> They're sort of stuck talking about things that they have no specifics for, while the rest of the country is really worried. People are really worried about a lot of things related to health care. You know, I, I think that the, the recession and the pandemic in particular have really brought to the fore the idea that it's nice to get good health insurance through your work until you have no work. And then, you're, then you have a problem. Also, I think that the pandemic has created to some people a greater empathy, a seriously greater empathy for other Americans who need to buy their own health insurance and are getting it through the, the marketplace. It's unpopular to take away these things that Obamacare has made common. It is almost hard to remember how hard it was to get pre-existing conditions covered. Well, I mean, I think the pandemic has made it so that platitudes are no longer enough. And this is, I think, a change where, I mean, I'm not talking about the hardcore partisans, right? If you're somebody who's a ride-or-die Trump guy, your mind's not going to change, But or a ride-or-die Democrat. But for most people who are not living this day in, day out, pandemics make platitudes pointless. And, and I think that's what we're seeing with these poll shifts, is that not everyone was engaged, not everyone was dealing with the pandemic on a daily basis, 
that you could say, oh, well, you could have these vague right or left wing things, but things become a lot more solid when you've got people like I do who I have lost, who are sick, neighbors, you know, I, I saw the ambulances pull people like it brings things into sharp relief. And it doesn't help at all that the top of the ticket is just wildly insensitive. The president's entire sequence over the last week has been so insensitive and so weird. I think Americans are not really that comfortable with a president who is this weird, corrupt, uh, liar, all that other stuff is one thing, but he's just weird. And I think that's a problem. I think it's a problem up and down the ticket. Steve Fries, Newsweek, Our Detroit. You can follow him on Twitter, at Steve Fries. Well, what a day. We'll have more local stories for you tomorrow. Thanks to Lauren for doing us a solid and joining us as a member on Patreon. And that's at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. You're getting a bourbon glass and our perpetual thanks. With that, I'm Jer Stays. Take care of each other, and I'll see you around Detroit.